Um, today we have a, a, a special guest from Honeywell Robotics, Dr. Sai Krishnamurthy. Um, Dr. Krishnamurthy received his PhD in robotics from NYU Tandon School of Engineering and is currently at Honeywell Robotics as an advanced software engineer. He is a big proponent of advancing K-12 STEM education and encouraging younger generations. So thank you so much, Sai, for coming, um, joining us virtually. And I believe you are a co-host, so you can share your screen now. Welcome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, just gonna share my screen real quick. Um, please let me know if you can see it. Yes. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, thank you, uh, Sheila, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you all for the opportunity to present. So uh, today we'll be uh, um, having a brief discussion about the role of uh, human workforce and industries uh, currently and industries of the future and how AI, ML, the artificial intelligence and machine learning and robotics is impacting uh, this, this paradigm. So um, I am uh, just, just a brief uh, just a brief introduction about myself. Uh, so I did my bachelor's in 2014 in electrical and uh, electronics engineering. And uh, so also received my master's in robotics in 2017. And as Sheila mentioned, I graduated uh, with a PhD from NYU in 2020. Uh, since then, I've been uh, working with uh, Honeywell Robotics. Uh, I started as a simulation engineer with robotics, but uh, since then I've transitioned full-time into software engineering role. And uh, and since my uh, PhD and master's days, I, I am a big I have been a big proponent in uh, uh, contributing to the K advancement of K through 12 STEM education and specifically in robotics. I've had the wonderful opportunity and uh, pleasure of contributing to some of uh, the major uh, K 12 programs at NYU, and uh, one few of them are like the New York City DOE uh, summer STEM program in robotics and science of smart city. So. Uh, Really fortunate to have done that. And uh, now moving on to us, to the agenda, I, I like to call it the script of today's play. So um, I, I wanted to keep it high level. Uh, at the same time, I also bought in some of the uh, case study material from Honeywell Robotics to show you guys how we are implementing robotics and how uh, humans are in the loop. But we will start with uh, a brief story of human advancement. And we will talk about the story of supply and demand, how automation and robotics fit into the play, and few applications and fields that are currently being, uh, uh, currently where robotics and automation is being used, and how humans are uh, involved in such uh, applications. And then we will walk through our own uh, applications in uh, Honeywell Robotics, how we implement AI, ML, robotics, and automation in, uh, uh, in our product portfolio. And uh, finally, uh, and most importantly, we're going to talk about the ethics and facts of uh, using robotics in industry and how automation is going to impact uh, the humans of the future. So this is the brief uh, agenda of what we're going to discuss today. So let's start with the first uh, uh, point, the story of human advancement. So here's how I like to uh, uh, call humanity. We are never satisfied with stagnation. We always look for progress. And uh, as much as we like to say, do not reinvent the wheel, we always reinvent the wheel. Uh, you know, we make it, we keep making it better and better in the name of optimization. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We always um, try and make improvements. Now, the, similarly, we, we like uh, individuals may be minimalistic, but as collectively as a society, we are more, more and more materialistic because uh, humanity overall like, consumes a lot of resources and uh, materials. Now, again, this is not a bad thing because we are always searching for a purpose. There is, there is reason in our madness, and uh, it's all collectively uh, for the advancement of humanity. But sometimes some of our advances are not always in good light. Some of them are conflict-driven, but at the end of the day, uh, there is a tunnel, uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, technologies that were developed due to conflict have been able, that we were able to repurpose it for, for the betterment of humanity. And industrialization is one such, one such uh, uh, advanced industrialization and the use of automation is one such thing. Now I'd like to call humanity uh, plastic. Uh, it's it's uh, because uh, our needs and requirements are not the same. We change, our requirements change and we easily adapt to this change. 
may not be all the time, but we are uh, we're very plastic, you know, plastic, and uh, we want the change uh, most of the time. Now, transitioning from that, I, I want to ask you guys some questions. Like, this the story of supply and demand. So, we like to call this another chicken and egg problem in uh, in material handling industry. Nobody knows what came first. Was it the supply that came first or was it the demand that came first? But at the end of the day, we have both right now. So there's supply and there's demand. And there's a very fine balance between you know, supply and demand. If one, one goes up and the other goes down, there's, there's chaos. So a few key questions to ask is, how did supply and demand change? What are the impacting factors? So the first and the most important factor, you know, starting with you know, from 19th century was industrialization. How did industrialization impact supply and demand? And how does industrialization impact the cross domestic product of, of a country or even the entire uh, world economy? And how is GDP affecting the per capita income or the purchasing power of an individual? Now, it's really important to talk about per capita income because uh, this is directly impacting how much uh, humanity is advancing. Because at the end of the day, our ability to to utilize resources is directing is directing how much we are producing and how much we are advancing. Now, there are a few key uh, factors that I've outlined and it's not limited to these, but a few of the most important factors that's affecting uh, the way humanity is progressing and the way we are consuming, the amount of resources and uh, consumption that humanity has is as follows. So first one, the most obvious one is the rise of global population. Human, the human population increases, our resource requirements increase. The next one is economic growth, because as, as the quality of life improvements go up, we require more and more upkeep. Education, globalization, and the third, uh, and the third, uh, the fifth point here is digitalization, which is what we call as the silent killer. Digitalization is making our world a global economy. It's it's called, you know, I like I really like the term the global village. It's connecting us more and more. At the same time, it's it's opening a lot of avenues for uh, advancement and consumption at the same time. It could be digital or it could be material. So digitalization is probably one of the most impactful uh, uh, reason for how uh, our global economy is increasing recently. And by all means, this is not this list is not uh, limited. There's a lot more factors. So I just covered a few of the most important ones. Now, why did I talk about um, global economy or resources or consumption and all that? There's, there's a reason. As our consumption increases, we have to keep up. We have to keep up with the demand because if you don't keep up with the demand, the supply stays stagnated, there's going to be chaos. We established that. Now, robotics and automation is a solution. It is being seen as a solution. Now, uh, we will see how that is that is being used and how that is being considered as a solution. But let's start with the, uh, the most important question. What is the difference between robotics and automation? So the easiest way I like to explain this uh, difference is uh, with the pictures on the right. So you see the picture on the, the top right corner with, uh, there's a, with a bunch of robots and uh, what it appears to be like an assembly plan for an automobile uh, manufacturer. And at the bottom, there's just one robot doing uh, just some building block assembly. So it, these two pictures are a very good uh, uh, way to understand the difference between automation and robotics. The first picture on the top right corner is automation. And the second picture is robotics. Now you may ask, well, the first picture also has robots. Well, that is correct because automation is the umbrella for robotics. Uh, automation facility or an automation structure may or may not include robotics. It's just uh, it, robotics could be used in automating a particular process or uh, a structured operation. So that is the one. so when we say automation, it could it could or it may or may not include robotics. So I'm I will be using the term automation in in general uh, to also see, you know, imply robotics. So now that we established that, I want to go straight to the jugular. So we need to. Uh, answer the, ask the question, why do we need automation in the current uh, world economy? So let's not discuss about the past, let's not discuss about the future, so let's talk about the present. Why do we need automation for now? Well, the first and probably the most important factor in, in the current day industry is safety. Human operator uh, safety and wellness must be put above everything else in uh, industrial operations. And it's not 
it's not fair and it's not right to expose a human operator to unnecessary and you know more than acceptable risk and the second most uh, concerning problem uh, especially with the, uh, the, uh, the ongoing the pandemic situation is the labor scarcity and this is not just impacting uh, uh, the material handling or the industrial uh, uh, industrial sector but it's impacting every every uh, job market that that is that is something that has caused a huge disruption in the world economy and the third one is in general it's a it's an ongoing problem um, this is something that has been uh, uh, prevalent since before the pandemic is the uh, how to tackle uh, certain job offerings which are menial menial in nature so certain jobs people just don't want to do it and i will give you an example of uh, such jobs and how automation is trying to resolve such uh, disruption now the fourth point is uh, definitely precision and the reason why i bring precision is uh, again we can take a look at the example on the uh, top right corner right so there's an automo automobile manufacturing facility with uh, a whole bunch of robots uh, what what uh, we can uh, assume here is happening is i think there's some sort of a weldment or an attachment going on these um, um, these vehicles now precision is really important in such situations because the end customer is humans and we want to make sure these products are designed to at most uh, quality. And there is no guarantee that a human operator will have the same level of precision at the start of the shift and at the end of the shift. There is fatigue, there is, there is tired, they, uh, operators tend to get tired. So there, there is a paramount like importance on making sure that the precision in industrial application, industrial sector is maintained. And this has to be done throughout the duration of the shift. So hours of operation, again, there, um, there is no specific hours of operation for the robot, like uh, an eight hour shift. So they are capable of working around the clock and that saves uh, industrial facility a lot on the cost. And it is important to talk about cost, especially in the industrial settings, because um, industries are run for profit and uh, there is very uh, high uh, importance also given to return on investment. So uh, making sure that the costs involved with running uh, operations, either uh, robotic automation or human-based operation is very important and return on investment is considered a lot. Now, this doesn't mean that robotics and automation has high uh, return on investment. There is also a lot of factors to consider, including the initial, uh, the cost of installation and the cost of development and all that. So there's a very fine difference between uh, uh, return on investment and then uh, wasteful expenditure. So a lot of companies do uh, research initially to make sure the proof of concept is good and only then they, uh, they, they install it in their facility. So we'll, we'll look at examples of that. Now, quickly going through uh, some of the current applications and fields where automation is being used. Um, and um, I have a bias here because I'm from the material handling industry. So I put it right on top, right, right there. So uh, Honeywell Robotics is positioned in the material handling space on, on the top right corner image. You, what you see there is a bunch of uh, packages tumbling down a conveyor belt. So um, this is one example of uh, automation where you can see that the packages, you know, your, your everyday Amazon delivery packages are something that you get on uh, the mail like FedEx, UPS, uh, DHL, all these go through some sort of automation before reaching you. So this is the material handling space. Whatever happens uh, between point A, uh, which is the origin, and point B, the destination, is the material handling. So it's a very extensive process, which, which also includes, for example, another example I really like to give you is um, when, you, when you travel by a plane, you have checked in baggage. Uh, how does it arrive at the bag baggage carousel? Sometimes even before you do. Most of the times it doesn't, but... Uh, Let's, let's ignore that. But there is a very intricate network of conveyor belts, uh, sortation systems, and scanners, and closed loop feedback systems that enable material to go from point A to point B. So this is one of the most uh, uh, popular uh, destination for automation and robotics, and that's, that's, uh, that's a space that I am in currently. The second one is uh, definitely manufacturing. This is probably the most uh, popular, uh, most well-known one because of the way uh, media uh, is uh, it's it's flashy as in you can see on the top uh, in the in the middle right image you can see the uh, assembly plant again with automobile manufacturing this is like the poster child of uh, automation when we see articles on uh, the internet or on the news news telecast 
But this, again, has a very important application because uh, there's high levels of precision and accuracy required in such tasks. Now, food processing, um, I'm not talking about agriculture yet uh, because agriculture, uh, the level of automation, we haven't uh, gotten there yet. There's a lot of uh, strides that are being made, but we haven't gotten to uh, the level of automation of robotics in agriculture. But food processing, yes, most of the, uh, uh, the consumer level uh, foods that we eat these days, not gourmet, but most of the consumer level uh, food products are manufactured in, uh, with some sort of automation. And if not uh, food processing, their packaging is definitely uh, automated. And then uh, in recent days, I've also seen a lot of uh, commercial construction robots that's uh, uh, assisting uh, crews in reducing the risk involved with some of the construction activities. And uh, one of the pictures that you see on the bottom left is a robot that is used to uh, fill in uh, concrete um, and then also sometimes do the blastering work. And in the bottom right corner, um, this is a night scope robot. This is, it's being used for security and surveillance. If uh, any of you have traveled recently um, late night at LaGuardia Airport, you might have seen uh, some of these robots. These are uh, autonomous. They'll be roaming around and they, they can assist you if, if you have any questions or if you want to just you know, have the robot hang out with you if you're not feeling safe. And uh, these are all the examples I've given so far are physical uh, robots and automation processes, but it doesn't have to be limited to like physical products. Data analytics and processing, something that can be, de can be done on software is also automation and robotics. So I just wanna make sure that that is clear. So robotics and automation is not just limited to the physical realm, but it's also something digital. So data analytics and processing, like AI, ML, all these are also uh, a part of automation and uh, robotics. And again, this list is, uh, this, uh, it's not limited to the, just what I've given here. It has a lot more uh, aspects involved. Now, we've talked about automation and robotics, but the most important thing that I wanted to uh, talk to you guys and show you is how are humans involved in developing and utilizing these um, resources and applications. So I like, I actually uh, separated the, uh, the organization. I would call this an organization into three sections, developers, suppliers, and consumers. So on the developer front, we have executives who make uh, the decisions on uh, go or no go. And we have offering management who essentially is responsible for coming up with unique solutions for problems. And then based on the feedback from offering management and the executives, the engineering comes into the play and they develop the solution. And then finally, uh, we have the sales and marketing who will push this product to the market. That is not the end of the story though, because we have operators on the customers end who will have to operate the application and the maintenance who periodically attend to the uh, application to service it. And if, if there's repair required, they just uh, maintain it. So this is on the developer front. And on the supplier front, we have OEM manufacturers, the original equipment manufacturer. Oh, that's redundancy. So OEMs right there. And the reason why I call OEMs is because most of the time applications, they don't, uh, uh, they don't build the entire application or uh, uh, product by themselves. There's small subcomponents that come from different manufacturers. It could be sensors, it could be wires, it could be nuts and bolts. So manufacturers, OEMs are really important. And then integrators. So Honeywell Robotics is one such integrator. We don't make robots, but we use robots to integrate it into an application. Quality and assurance, really important because any product that comes out of uh, a supply chain, it needs, to be, uh, it needs to go through quality and assurance and safety and compliance. This is uh, one of the most, uh, uh, I would say the most important uh, part in product approvals because safety and compliance and security is, if it doesn't go through safety, compliance and security, the product is never coming in. Regulators externally or internally are also important because when a product is launched, it has to maintain its, uh, its legitimacy. It has to maintain its uh, functional acceptance criteria, and, and the regulators are the ones to uh, make sure that this is all being followed to the point, to the bullet. Financial institutions can also, uh, will also play an important role because someone's got a bankroll at the time. Now, consumers, on the other hand, uh, they are the ones that utilize what, was, what came out of the development and the supply. 
So end customer, it could be anyone, it could be an industry, it could be an entire community, or it could be an individual. That's one of, uh, they are one of the consumers. KPI analysts, KPIs are the key performance uh, indicators. The KPI analysts are the ones who will investigate the performance coming out of the customer's feedback. And they will, as they will provide feedback on if this is matching uh, the, the requirements or not. Then definitely we have stakeholders. And overlooked fact, salvagers, because hardware has uh, a limited life cycle. And at the end of the day, this has to be salvaged. So salvagers are also recyclers. So it's, again, a circle of life that comes back. So the reason why I, I put this slide up here is to show that by no means um, in the current uh, automation and robotic side that the human is out of the loop. There's a lot of uh, involvement in, in human operators, in, in development, in supply and manufacturing and the consumption process. And if, if I were to give you a rough estimate, I think, uh, in, in a specific application, robotics is just 1% and you know the rest of it, like 99% of it is just human operations and human development right, going on right there. So, uh, so moving from there, I just wanna give you a, a good outlook on how we are using automation and robotics in one such uh, context. So in here, uh, I haven't really talked a lot about AI, ML, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, but here I just want to give you a brief uh, case study of how we actually transition to automation in something that we are trying to automate. So this is like automation of automation. So uh, most of you here uh, might have heard about uh, some of the novel image processing automation with AI, ML, how we use um, algorithms to identify some of the interesting feature points. And in here, this is, this is one such uh, application that one of our robots utilize. On the, on the right hand, you see a bunch of, uh, uh, on the right hand side of the slide, you will see a bunch of images, what, what we are uh, on, on pallets. So these are just pet food products that we put on the pallet. Now, if we were to train an AI ML algorithm to identify the pet food bags, uh, what would originally be required is in a, in a supervised learning algorithm, the, to train such an algorithm, we need a lot of annotated training images. So when I say annotated training images, um, uh, someone needs to actually painstakingly sit in front of a computer and draw a bounding box around these, each of these uh, pet food products and then label it. Label it if it's a dog food bag or if it's a cat food bag or if it's something not related to pet food. So these annotations are required. Now, for our application, we needed around half a million of these images just for uh, training purposes. And uh, we actually uh, outsource this to other companies and we, we get the training data within a few weeks. Now, there's a few risks involved with this. Number one, the training data is never sufficient. The more training data we provide, uh, the better uh, sometimes the learning algorithm gets. And uh, more, it's not too often, but sometimes we do get uh, mistakes in some of the annotations. And that will lead to adverse learning. So it's, it's important to avoid such mistakes. Now, uh, keep in mind that all these annotations are being done by hand for all of each and every one of these half a million images. And these images are real. So someone also has to record 500,000 of such uh, images, which is, which is a lot. So the solution, well, let's build a simulation and synthetically generate all these images and automatically annotate them. Now, how did we do that? We used simulation. So on the bottom left corner, you can see some of the real world images. We just used 3D scanner to scan some of these pet food, um, pet food bags. And then we added it to our simulation that you see in the, uh, the, the third image on the, uh, the left, bottom left side. That's the uh, smart, flex deep, uh, smart flexible depalletizer simulation environment. So we put it in the simulation environment and um, on the right side, I show you, show you the difference between synthetically generated and the real world generated data and how our AI algorithm is uh, running its inference, how it thinks the images are, uh, uh, how it identifies different products. And as you can see from the images, the AI uh, inference doesn't see a difference between synthetically generated and real world images. So what did, how did this change our application and uh, uh, process? Well, now we don't really need to have uh, we don't need, really need to take half a million training images and then have them manually annotated and then, you know, just pray there are no mistakes. Now we just 
run an algorithm for uh, a day or so, and we have as many images as we need. So we are overcoming the, uh, the cost, the complexity, and we are adding more uh, legible data to our training process. So this is one such application of how automation is, is actually helping to uh, you know, increase the quality of our products. Now, the second application that I want to talk about is the uh, smart flexible depalletizer. So what I show you here on the top right, the, the video on the top right corner is the smart flex depal cell in action. So what this is doing is actually just depalletizing a pallet. That's all it's doing. It's it's called a mix queue. So mix queue stands for a pallet which has multiple products on it. It's not a uniform pallet. It has different sizes. It could be different consistency products. So this is something that is menial in nature for a human operator to do because all they're doing is just unpack, just unloading boxes of a pallet. And because of huge labor shortages, several uh, industrial, industrial facilities have reached out saying, hey, we need a product that can be palletized because there's severe labor shortage and they're not, not, they're not able to keep up with the supply chain, supply chain demand. So this product is very simple. It's just depalletizing from a pallet. Now, while the application is simple, it's a routine and repeatable task. It's not, it's, it's not unpredictable. It's a very predict, predictable uh, application and task. There's a lot of uh, process that's involved because number one, the robot needs feedback. And number two, it needs to make sure that it, it, it keeps up with the human's level of operation. So it, it has to be equal to or better than what a human being performs. Right? So this is an application that we have developed here at Honeywell Robotics. And uh, how we do that is number one, we simulate the entire application. We do not build a robot to you know, just start with, we simulate it. In, uh, uh, in a proper end-to-end uh, -end simulation where we, we apply our software, we apply our computer vision, then we train our algorithms, and only then we go and build the actual robot and uh, do the testing on it. So there's a, proce there's a due process that's followed in automation, and this is a multi-month uh, uh, research endeavor and also commercialization endeavor. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, just, to, just to also add, there's a lot of uh, AI involved with, uh, with such uh, applications because in order to match the level of human competence, um, the robot utilizes something called as a machine learning motion planner because when a human being is taking a box from point A to point B, they just have a smooth motion. But without an AI ML, uh, the robot does something of this, like a squared motion. And this makes us lose a bunch of time when the robot is unloading thousands of boxes over a duration of, you know, uh, decades. So machine learning models are trained based on uh, the way the smooth transition, just to make sure that we don't, uh, we don't waste a lot of time in doing the uh, U-shaped motion. And the second one is also there's, there's an AI involved in identifying the, the uh, objects. And in the bottom left corner, you can actually see there's a, there's, a, there's a huge stand in front of the robot in the simulation. That is where the blue region and the, on the top is where the cameras are mounted. So the camera is looking top down and it's looking at the, uh, the pallet and then telling the robot where to go and pick. So this is a closed loop feedback system. And the third application that I want to talk about, this is not, this is not a robotic solution. This is automation. Uh, it's, uh, it's an ASRS system. It stands for the Automated Storage and Retrieval System. So most of the warehouses and distribution facilities these days, uh, they, are, uh, they are automated with uh, ASRS systems because number one, they're highly efficient and they're space saving because they do not require a forklift and an operator to manage uh, pallets that are stored really high in the air. So um, ASRS is one such application. And, and the reason why they're really good is one, one punchline is they can handle like for example, the Honeywell ASRs can handle over 20,000 SKUs, and it's been shown to be over 40% uh, uh, more efficient than manual picking, which is, which is uh, ridiculous. Now, even though we have ASR systems, by no means as a human out of the loop, because at the end of the day, ASR systems also need to be integrated with uh, human operators for inventory management, tracking, and uh, uh, fulfillment. And that is why there is there's specifically something called a, as a GTP station, goods to person station, where a human operator is asking the uh, ASR system to facilitate uh, bringing a specific uh, tote from the uh, from storage and then checking inventory and sending it back. Now the automation, what it's doing is it's removing the the need to search for a specific tote, 
uh, to, to go fetch it. And the time it reduces significantly reduces the time it takes to like uh, facilitate such an operation. So that is the advantage of an ASRS. Uh, now let's, let's talk about the ethics and facts. And I will ask the most obvious question, is automation stealing humans' jobs? Um, well, I wanna make sure that uh, I give you the most transparent answers Answers in you know, regard with this. Automation is not ready for non-routine and unpredictable tasks. So anything, any task which is routine, predictable and repeatable, that it, it has a very high chance of being automated. So. There is a risk that if such a job is being performed by a human operator at this, this point, industry and companies may look for automation alternatives for such, for such a task. So it's really important for us to retrain and educate our workforce in doing, um, in transitioning to some of the non-routine and unpredictable tasks. And there are many. Automation is not, uh, not too prevalent yet. There's, it's still a, a work in progress. What this is allowing us to do is it's, increasing the value for human operators time. Because as, as, a, as the example showed, we are not, uh, we're not letting humans operate pallets, like depalletize from eight foot pallets, really heavy boxes. Uh, instead, we are making them operate such machinery. We are converting unskilled labor into skilled labor. We are giving them a transition and valuing their time even more. And, uh, and also one of the other uh, major reasons is we wanna uh, make sure that the operator safety and compliance is followed. And uh, something that I mentioned like just a few seconds back is safety because um, these boxes on eight foot pallets that are depalletized are close to sometimes close to 40 or 50 pounds. And those are being removed from a height of eight feet. And this is, uh, this is definitely not a safe environment and uh, has, has a high level of risks involved. Now, even though like there are some, uh, th there's some tasks do not have automation yet, these are facing uh, huge labor scarcity issues, and this is in supply chain. I'm I'm pretty sure some of you have uh, gone to a car dealership recently and asked for uh, asked to look at some cars, and they're like, "No, yeah, we have a five thousand dollar markup because of chip shortage, supply chain issues." And the reason why there's supply chain issues is because uh, the pandemic has caused a disruption in the industry, and that disruption actually led to a huge labor scarcity, and also uh, some of the some of the tasks that could have been automated, uh, which are not yet automated, are facing labor, labor and uh, uh, resource shock. So we need to fill this void. If not, the economy is not gonna keep up with the increasing demand. Now, another point is to reduce operational expenses. So when humans are involved in the loop, uh, it's not just about uh, the payroll, it's about safety, and it's also about making sure that uh, the environment is compliant and insured. So uh, this all adds up to the operation costs and automation not necessarily uh, is, I wouldn't say it's like significant cost reduction, but it is uh, optimizing the costs, operational expenses and keeps up with the productivity of the facility and allows for future expansions. Now, by no means uh, is this uh, like a one-stop solution. Automation and robotics is not a one-stop solution. And it is one of these solutions for keeping up with the increased demand of growing world economy and and it's really important to understand that it's not like a single day like transition it's a gradual transition it may take a few years it may take a few decades but it definitely takes time for fruition and um and that and to a point where you know we enjoy the perks of this is this is transitioning to my uh, pre-final slide which is what what do what is the end goal of automation we want to enjoy the perks of automated last mile delivery. We want to be the consumers. We want to be the, uh, the, the inventors and we want to be the consumers. Everything in between that has to be automated. We want to promote STEM education and encourage our younger generations to pursue careers in STEM. And we definitely want to con convert uh, unskilled labor into highly sophisticated careers. And human operators by at, by at any cost should be exposed to minimal or no risk environments. and that can be done with, with continuous automation and making sure that it reaches greater heights and then we always aim for the stars. Now, I just wanna add one extra uh, uh, slide here, just wanna talk about the pathways to becoming an expert in automation. So um, when, when we talk about robotics and automation, the one thing that comes into mind is usually engineering, uh, 
um, and data sciences and computer science, but that is not limited to just engineering and computer science. There's a lot of pathways into becoming an expert in automation. Well, mechanical engineering, we have CAD, computer aided design, dynamics and construction. We have electrical software engineering. We also have, you know, uh, what we call as the data sciences track where this has nothing to do with engineering management and construction, but it's purely based on the numbers, like the mathematics of data analytics and artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is also considered a critical part of automation. And a lot of people uh, ask me this question, but um, management, um, our offering management, marketing, and uh, calculation of financial return of investment, most, mostly the executive branch of uh, uh, running a robotics uh, organization is also a crucial uh, part of robotics and automation because this is where uh, executive decisions are made. And uh, one such thing, uh, offering management, which is really interesting is uh, because you require a degree of understanding. You need to empathize with your customers and then come up with unique solutions for their problems and then uh, communicate this to the engineering so we can come up with solutions. This, this is uh, something that is a part of the offering management. So uh, with that, uh, I want to uh, stop my presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I want to open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. All right, do we have any questions? Jacob, you raised your hand. Yeah, yeah. so um, so I, nice talk. I mean, I, I, had a, I had a bunch of questions. Um, let me just start with one very broad one and try to connect this a little bit to, um, to cognitive science. So I, I guess my question is, do you see any place in either contemporary technology or in maybe in future technology where it would be desirable for um, robots to, in some sense, work more like people? So, I mean, you describe some situations where robots can do work that people couldn't safely do, for example. But, um, and obviously there are some parts of the chain that robots can't currently do, like the more creative aspects, as you mentioned. But, um, but I, for routine uh, functions in the middle of the, of the chain of production, are there, are there places where it would be good to design robots to be doing things, uh, to be solving tasks in a way that are more like um, the way people do them? And of course, the reason I'm asking is because I am wondering if there's how much interest there is in contemporary robotics in the way people actually, the way the human brain actually solves problems? So very good question, um, Jacob. So actually one, one direct example I can give is service robotics. Uh, that is actually an open puzzle right now, uh, which automation is, uh, robotics is not able to solve at this point. And it's, it's an ongoing research topic. And uh, service robotics, anything that involves uh, uh, patient care, anything that involves like uh, uh, geriatric care, stuff like that. So uh, one major, uh, uh, there was a review article recently that said, well, it's applicable. People have started using robots in, um, in service robotics, but uh, at, at some point it just gets rejected. And the reason why it, it, it's not close enough uh, to, to be a, a human, uh, human uh, care, right? It's not close enough. Uh, as a human uh, caretaker would be. So there's a lot of ongoing research in that, in that specific field because there we need the robot to be as human as possible. We don't want it to be a robot. We need, we need to be as human as possible. Um, and uh, an interesting research that I took part in uh, while I was at NYU is uh, it's, it's a robot called CSER. It stands for a Cellularly Accessible Expressive Semi-Autonomous Robot. But CSER is just a robot that does expressions. It's just uh, a robot that does uh, seven expressions, happy, sad, angry, surprised. Um, and what this robot does is it's interacting with uh, children with autism. And it's, it's trying to, uh, there, it's, it's, it's trying to just mimic expressions so that uh, the children will have eye contact with the robot. They may not have eye contact with regular humans, but they may have eye contact with the robot because it's not human but they're trying to like reinforce this behavior. So these are some of the interesting uh, uh, research topics that's going on, um, but that's definitely something that requires a human touch in robotics. 
And uh, at the same time, it's it's such an open ended question. It's it's such an open ended problem right now. <laughs> I mean, if I can follow up a little bit, I mean, you know, you, you raised the issue in your talk of um, whether robots are going to replace human workers, and and I mean, I, I may be um, this may be unfair, but I would I would summarize your answer as uh, not yet. <laughs> um, meaning that it's going to take a while and people shouldn't worry tomorrow, but but they'll, in the long run, they might. And um, I mean, they might have reason to. And what you're raising now about service robotics is that, is, you know, is that although it's very difficult to replace a service worker uh, with a robot, you know, we're working on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I mean, by that, by that framing, like, why? What, why? Are we trying to replace every human worker eventually, except for the except for the last holdouts of who would be, of course, the roboticists themselves who design the next generation of robotics. I mean, that's a very negative framing. I don't really believe that, but I'm, it's a fair I mean, question. That's that's the, a fair I'm question. paraphrasing your own answer. So what do you think about that? That's, that's a fair question. And yes, the answer is uh, eventually, like the best, the best way to answer that is depends on the task, because I did mention it uh, briefly, but any task, it could be something like just moving a box, like, uh, so most of one of one of one such application, I will give you an application actually. Uh, United States Postal Services, U.S. Postal Services has a person standing at the edge of a conveyor. All they're doing is taking an envelope, scanning, and dropping it on a bin. That's all they're doing. Now, there there are operators who do such a task over decades, over decades, and at one point they couldn't find people to do that. There's no more applications for such. There were, there were no more job applicants for such a task because the, uh, the, the generational shift has happened. People are more educated. They don't want to do that job anymore. And that is when USPS was like, well, we need to automate this because this is a repeatable job and this is not, it is a very predictable environment. So the answer to the question is eventually any task that is to a degree of uh, predictable, will be replaced. It, it includes any of the tasks that we are doing as well. For, I, uh, that's, that's the reason why I gave you the example of uh, the AI ML training, because that is something that we were doing earlier. We were annotating the quality of images. We were selecting uh, images and all that. And at one point, well, we can automate this. We can generate it synthetically. And there goes uh, uh, the, uh, the data training aspect. So th that is one, one such, uh, there, there is that aspect involved with job automation and transition, yes. But at the end of the day, yes, uh, in any task that is predictable, repeatable, and uh, in, in a very uh, routine setting has a potential to be automated. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. Off can we go, Brian? We have another question. Um, yeah, so. The very first bullet point on this last slide is about what we all really want. We want automated last mile delivery. I was actually watching a really interesting video um, last week about this and about why this is so difficult, why it has been so difficult. Because I totally forgot that there was so much hype for drone delivery like 10 years ago. And then it just sort of evaporated. And it turns out there's like all kinds of problems based on like how we structure our communities that make this really difficult, like places for them to land and um, like restricted airspace and stuff. So I feel like we talk a lot about how automation is going to change society, but less about the ways in which we're probably going to wind up changing society to, to fit automation. It's like, is that also happening or is that something that has to happen where we're going to have to sort of reshape the way that we structure our communities and structure our lives to make space for automation so this stuff can work? So I would say that that shouldn't happen because we should not, uh, automation is for us not the other way around. And if, if it gets to a point where we would have to change our own, uh, our own quality of life or the way we live for automation to work, then it defeats the purpose. Something is terribly designed. Um, now to address uh, the, uh, the question that the application that you actually saw, yes, uh, there was a lot of chatter about drone based last mile delivery. And uh, yes, at, at the end of the day, it did not, there's pilots going on in few places, but it's not really practical because of the, the engineering limitations with such tasks because there's not all packages are five pounds and you know box shape. There's different sizes and it's it's not 
feasible at, at the end of the day. Now, when I mean last mile delivery, so a product's life cycle right now is when we order something on, let's say Amazon, if I ordered a, a bunch of pencils on Amazon, uh, what's happening is the manufacturer is anticipating your demand and they're pre-making it. They're making the pencils and they're shipping it to a warehouse facility well in advance. It's not happening in, in immediately, but it's happening well in advance, a few minutes in advance. It's sitting in a distribution facility. It's actually sitting in a warehouse and the anticipatory uh, demand, uh, it's, it's essentially a, a huge uh, software program. It's called a warehouse execution system. It anticipates the demand and takes it from the warehouse and moves it to a distribution facility. And that is where it waits till you order it. And as soon as you order it, it goes in a conveyor. It goes through an intricate conveyor and lands in a bin where a human operator takes it, puts it in the packaging box, packs it and drops the package on uh, the other conveyor. And that conveyor takes it to the truck, which is destined for an airport or depending on how far the destination is. Now, from that point until it reaches a delivery van, it's all automated. But once it reaches a delivery van, that's when it's, there's human involved in the loop because the last mile delivery, where it goes from your local post office or your local distribution center to your home is not automated. And this is where the most mistakes happen, actually. Now, this is also one of the most complicated problem to solve in supply chain industry because um, like number one, it's it's human dwellings are not like structured. We are all over all over the place, and each each individual has a different environment, and that is why robotics. It's hard for drones or even delivery like small. There's there's some robots that just go on sidewalks and then just deliver packages. Those don't work because there's too many um, um, unpredictable things happening, unstructured environments. Now there is. Uh, a lo lot of talk on how to automate this. There has to be human in the loop involved, at least for the foreseeable future. But this is this is the goal. If that can be done, that would be the ultimate like last mile delivery fulfillment. Everything will be automated from manufacturing all the way to delivery. Do we have another question? Yeah, one quick question. Um, so uh, this question is coming out of the fact that I used to be someone that did unload pallets for a living. <laughs> and um, there were different guys did it different ways and different pallets, you had different algorithms. And I'm certain that your robots have seen many more pallets stacked many more different ways than I ever did. And I'm curious if there's ever been an optimization going the other way that the depalletization process that's developed for the robot develops new algorithms that in the cases where it still has to be done by a human, there are cases where you can take that information and translate it back and say, here are better processes from humans that we learned by building a robot, as opposed to the robot's always just gonna do a better version of what the human was doing. You have, you have any instances of that? Uh, not really. Okay. Not really. We, 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 we really don't, uh, um, influence human behavior. We don't, uh, we don't impose human behavior on the robot when it comes to algorithm on how it depalletizes. Right. Now we do have something called, uh, we do have certain heuristics which will determine what package is the ideal candidate to remove off of a pallet. Because a pallet is a very tall, uh, heavy uh, entity. And if you remove the wrong piece, just like a huge Jenga tower, it's gonna collapse, right? So the robot is intelligent enough to understand that there's some candidates, even though it detects a lot of boxes, it needs to pick the right box in order to maintain stability of the pallet. Now, this is something that we have, uh, we have programmed into the robot through uh, its intelligence. It's, it's programmed as a part of the heuristic to pick the right box. And at the same time, now you may ask like, what, what is the right, right way to pick a box off of a pallet. Human beings would pick the box that's closest to them, right? We just pick the box that's closest and we move, you know, the least amount of effort. That's, that's what we try. <laughs> and that is what the robot has learned eventually through its ML motion planner. So it just, there's a cost function and it's always trying to reduce the cost function. And then we figured out that, hey, I saved the most amount of energy and reduce the cost function by always picking the boxes closest to me and then going for the ones that's far away from me. Because if there's something in my way, 
if there's a box here, I would have to go over it. But if I remove this first, the next box can directly be removed. So let me take it uh, and turn it upside down because the hardest part is actually building the pallet such that <laughs> it can survive the tilt that happens when you have to move it up a ramp or over a lift to get it into the truck or into the storage or whatever. And that's something that humans, from my personal experience, suck at, is to anticipate how optimally to put the pallet together in the first place with the stability. So I, I'm kind of curious. It seems to me that's a place where the, the, the algorithmic knowledge that's developed from the robotic approaches to depalletizing can then potentially lead you to invert it more, to, in, to reverse the process more effectively in terms of the same stability data you just referenced? Yes, we, we haven't built a palletizer yet. That's that's one of the questions that we've been getting a lot because we've been to trade shows, uh, we've recently been to Modex as well, and all our customers and all the visitors are like really amazed. And then they're like, well, where's your palletizer? Yeah. Like, we haven't built it yet. <laughs> that's the hard part. <laughs> right, uh, but that is, that is an important application. We want to build it soon. Right. Thank you so much, Sai, for coming and joining us at the Rutgers Center for Cognitive Science. Thank you so much. Um, so now this portion of the talk, we're gonna take five minutes and then Dr. Ryan Rhodes will join us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us, Sai.